Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, third and final uh, presentation from our ITSM transformation webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to go over managing your ITSM project to success. Uh, my name is Alexander Mazurik with Quint Wellington Redwood, and I'll be your host during today's session. Now, just a few things about our organization, Quint Wellington Redwood. Um, we're a completely independent management consulting firm. We've been in business now uh, since 1992. We were established over in Amsterdam, but today we've uh, expanded to be a completely global company. We have over 250 consultants operating in 49 countries on just about every single continent around the world. Um, our core business practices include sourcing, architecture, governance, lean IT, service management, of course, and DevOps. Um, we're very proud to say that for the last three years running, we've been selected as a top global advisor on sourcing and governance by the IAOP uh, in the areas of client satisfaction, delivery of excellence, and innovation, innovation programs. Um, we're very proud to say that. And last off, we're also proud to be a uh, trendsetter in the areas of ITSM, of course, Lean IT, and DevOps. As I mentioned before, this is the uh, third session of our ITSM Transformation webinar series. Uh, two weeks ago, first, we covered planning an effective ITSM transformation. And then last week, um, we went into scoping it and how to scope your IT services to maximize value. And uh, today's session, we'll be covering uh, how to actively manage your ITSM project uh, to success. And if you've missed the, the two prior sessions, I just want to remind everyone that on our Vimeo channel, um, you can actually view recordings of the two prior webinars if you had missed those, I'd like to go back to that. Um, now, just a quick recap of last week's session, which was on scoping, of course. Um, these are the, the three highlights that we have from that session uh, to segue into today's session. Uh, first off, uh, we covered you know, how scoping IT services is about supporting outcomes, um, especially through vital business functions. Also, we uh, also explained to structure your SMS around scope in order to maximize value. And also touched on how to use Idle Practitioner uh, plus CSI to define and narrow your ultimate service scope. And uh, now, without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our presenter today, uh, Kevin, Kevin Dutton. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Alex for the introduction. Hi, a very good morning, good afternoon or good evening everyone depending on where you are. Thank you for taking time to attend this webinar today where I will be talking about the essentials to make the change or improvement happen, thus leading to a successful ITSM project initiative. Uh, first, a little introduction about myself. Um, my name is Kevin Dutton and I have been in IT for about 25 years now. Started my career as a hardware engineer working on IBM mainframes before moving on to application support, release management, and network management before stepping into IT service management space um, back in 2005. And since then, I have been doing both consulting and training, not only in ITIL, but also in ISO 20000, Lean IT, and COVID. During the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to work in different parts of the world, and that has enabled me to gain experience and knowledge about the different working environments and culture, which play a very important role in any change or improvement initiative. And I hope to share some of that with you today. So let's get started. All right. Yes, we are all excited about improvements. We know we want to do it but we don't know or have a challenge with is how and where do we start? Perhaps you have just attended an ITIL training course and you now know, understand and see how valuable the framework is and how your organization can benefit from it or you have already implemented service management and are aware of your pain points today and therefore potential areas of improvement. But where and how do you start with these improvements that must take place? Yes, customers are still screaming that IT is slow, unresponsive, and not meeting their needs. IT is respon responding by saying that there is too much work, no coordination between groups and processes do this. What now? Any change is not easy. Doing a technical change, for example, modifying something in the infrastructure either on the network or server, always carries risks that the change may fail. It is because of this we have to change management process. However, 
implementing improvements in the way we do things or changing the way we work is actually more difficult and the reason for this is that it involves one side that a technical change does not and that is the human side. So I hope to share with you today some essentials and thoughts about how we could manage this human side so that our improvement initiatives will succeed. Okay, let's stop and take one step backwards and ask ourselves why are we improving? There is always a reason or a trigger of why we want to improve or why we need to improve. Now here we see some examples of typical customer expectations from IT on what we call the voice of the customer. You may recognize some of them and probably have even more that you could think of. Now, being in IT, we are often plagued with customers who expect or want more than what we are, are already delivering to them. One of the reasons for this is that from the customer's perspective, they are not getting what they need. Their expectations are not being met, possibly resulting in an interruption to their business process or vital business function. Hence, the customers are frustrated. Here we have IT's view of the challenges that IT is currently facing. Now this is just a small sample of some common issues. Again, you may be familiar with more than what it is written here. Essentially, there is a relationship between what the customer's concerns are and what challenges IT is facing. Due to these issues, the services that we are delivering suffers and thus does not meet customers' expectations. So, what do we need to do about all those challenges? Only one thing, we need to improve. Because if we do not, no matter how much we want to, these issues will Unfortunate, unfortunately not go away by themselves. So we have to step in, take control and make the necessary improvement changes. I'll share with you five key essentials we need to have to make our improvement initiative a success. So yes, we want to improve. The question now is where do we start and how? We start with the need to have clear and relevant objectives, which is the first of the five essentials. In order to gain maximum support, any improvement will require clear and relevant objectives, which makes sense in the context of the organization which the improvement is being introduced into. Now these objectives should be based on what the customer determines is of value or what the customer wants which we call the voice of the customer. It should not be what IT believes is of value. So what do we want to improve? Now it's easy to in the maze of issues and challenges we are facing. So I have a recommendation which is to do a simple exercise using nothing more than sticky notes with your team or group members. I call this the sticky notes exercise. First, gather your team members in a room. It could be your own support group or even IT department if it's done at management level. What you need to do is give each person in the room some sticky note pads. Then, start with asking each person to write down three things they know that the customers wants, each on a separate sticky note. Wait, a word of caution here. If we have not asked the customer what they want or if they have not told us so, then we actually need to start with what we think the customers want. This is because sometimes what we think they want is not what they really want. So the recommendation here is we need to ask the customer. We need to ask them basically. Only when we ask the customer do we really know what they want. Yeah? Now, 
as each person writes three things down, we will then have a collection of things that we think the customer wants or expects from IT. Depending on the number of team members, we could end up with maybe 10, 15, 20 or more of such ones. Now, some of these may be duplicates, and that is good because that shows we are on the same page. We recognize the same issues. If they are duplicates, just combine them together. Then we repeat the same activity, but this time with three IT challenges. So now we get each person to write down on three separate sticky notes, three IT challenges they are aware of or that they are facing. And best to let the team members be honest here about the environment, the team, the organization, anything. It's surprising for many, it is often difficult to talk about the elephant in the room. Yeah. So participants need to be assured that they can write anything. This is, after all, a brainstorming session and there is no wrong answer. Once this is done, try and see if we can link them together, specifically what the customers wants to what IT's challenges are. The idea here is to see if these challenges could be a cause of the issues the customer is facing. Now in the example here, we see that the customer wants quick response times, that means fast turnarounds. Unfortunately, IT is not able to do so, possibly because of a lack of training, a lack of processes, or even lack of resources. So spend some time here with the group to discuss and see how these IT challenges may relate or be a root cause to what the customers want using all the sticky notepads we have collected. Now, once we have made the relationships, we then have to pick one of the challenge that we would want to focus on that is within the capability of the team or organization to improve. Here is where the group determines that if we do improve this, it will benefit and bring value to customer and fulfill one of their wants. This then becomes your clear and relevant objective. So at the end of this simple exercise, you will know what you want to improve, and more importantly, the reason or why you have to improve it. Once we have determined our objective, we then move on to the second essential, which is to have a strong and committed leadership. It's crucial that improvements has the active support of sponsors and day-to-day -day leaders within the organization. So a sponsor could be a manager or a supervisor or a business leader who advocates for and can authorize the change that needs to take place. So these leaders have to be identified, their roles and responsibilities clearly communicated to everyone in the improvement initiative. Next, the third essential is the need to have willing participants. The improvement needs participants who are willing to make the required change. Now, chances are not everyone will be on board with the change, resist it for a variety of reasons. Here, if you have done the sticky note exercise with them as a group or a team, we have actually made them a participant. It is hoping that by getting them involved from the very beginning, uh, it will turn them into willing participants, specifically if the issues that we are trying to improve concern them too. But resistance can and will happen. Therefore, we need to ensure that such resistance, if they exist, are quickly identified, addressed, and overcome. So over the next few slides, we will step out a little specifically to focus on resistance. Because if you do not address resistance, we will get nowhere with this improvement initiative. So to help us, we will look at five common reasons why people resist in the first place. First, why do people resist? The first and most compelling reason is they do not see the need to change. Why do I need to change? A question that in today's context surrounds us every day. The biggest reason people resist change is fear of the unknown. 
people will only move forward towards the future state once they believe or more importantly feel that the risk of staying where they are today is greater than the risk of moving forward. If they do not understand the need for the change, they will resist, especially people who believe that status quo is the only way things can be done. Now do note that culture will also play a part. How long has the organization been operating for? How long has the employees been working in the organization? How many times and how often have the organization made changes? If past change initiatives failed or were poorly managed, there may be a lack of trust on improvements. If the benefits and rewards are not seen as adequate when compared with the effort required to make a change, there will also be resistance. So if employees have experienced a lot of change within the organization, they may also be suffering from change fatigue. Now, we need to be aware of all of these. Second reason, they are not able to see what the end looks like. They do not see the vision of what we wanted to achieve here, thereby they could be confused. Perhaps we have not explained the purpose well enough okay, uh, about the issues we are trying to resolve. If this is so, we need to ensure we communicate the goal of the improvement clearly. Third reason, they do not, they do not see or understand the plan to improve plan? What plan? How do we get there? Do we have a plan of how we get to where we want to be? We have to be able to educate them that yes, this has indeed been well thought of and yes, there is a plan to get where we want to be. If we have a plan or a roadmap, it needs to be communicated to, to them. If you don't have a plan, chaos might result. Fourth reason, the fear of the anticipated extra work. Uh oh, you mean I have to do this extra work? I'm already so busy and now you're asking me to do more? What? Now, they are frustrated because they may have to do more. Unfortunately, this is one fear that might be true. For example, formalizing and institutionalizing the change management process for operational changes. Nobody likes the change management process because it takes too much time and effort and requires tons of paperwork to be created. But it is a required process that must be followed. There is no choice. It's not an option. Similar with the improvements we want to do. Chances are it may include having to do more work. And lastly, the fifth possible reason, lack of knowledge or skill or competence. It could be that they have not been properly trained or lack the skill set to do the new work that is going to be assigned or that they are going to be responsible or even accountable for. They probably believe they uh, may not have the competence to do what is expected of them. So this results could then be fearful and thus res resist. So we have to prepare them, which is actually the next essential we will touch on. Okay, so these are five compelling reasons why people resist. Okay, now that we have willing participants, we look at the fourth essential, which is the need to have prepared participants. The improvements may require changes in a person's working practices or the tools that they are using today. So people are usually more willing to change if they feel they have been suitably prepared. To do so, we need to give them the appropriate training to make sure that um, they feel comfortable with the change that is happening. They can use the tools and procedures that is uh, being changed. So everyone needs to be prepared for the change. And lastly, the fifth essential is the need to have sustained improvements. We need to keep the momentum going. Many improvements fail because after a while people tend to revert to the old ways of working. As I say, old habits die hard. Thereby, to prevent them from doing so, we need to continually reinforce the value of change through regular communication and with the support of sponsors and leaders who can also support it by encouragement and last but not least, enforcement. Okay, so for any change or improvement we want to do, these five essentials must be there to ensure a greater chance of success. All right, previously we saw that resistance could impact the success of our improvement initiative. In almost all projects I have worked on, there has always been some sort of resistance. Essentially, people do not like to change the way they are currently working. Therefore, 
um, they are usually very comfortable the way they are. Okay, so resistance must be managed. Now I'm going to spend a little time here to to look a little deeper into how we can do so. How can we manage resistance? First, resistance. Yes, it is there indeed. Okay, there is this quote that says, "People do not resist change; they resist being changed." So, what must we do? First, identify resistance. Don't resist it. Only when we have identified resistance can we manage and overcome it. This is key. So we will now look at seven possible ways to help us identify resistance that may exist within our group. First, we need to provide a safe feedback channel for employees to provide comments on the improvement initiative. Our employees need a way of making themselves heard, so we have to provide them the proper tools to do so. It could be emails, social media channels, response to a survey. Okay, we need to make sure this happens early in the initiative to identify resistance so that we can take action quickly. Second, listen to what people are saying around the workplace and understand the objectives. This can happen in formal contexts such as team meetings or interviews or informal situations such as conversations around the water cooler or even during lunch. Third, talk to line managers and sponsors to obtain feedback as to where they believe resistance is coming from. Fourth, ask questions, especially when you do not get any feedback or nobody says anything. Questions could include like, do you know why we are making these changes? Do you support the change? Do you have the training and or support you need in regards to this change? Fifth, be aware of people saying yes but doing no. Through observation of behavior, identify the people who claim they agree with the change but find it hard to make the transition. If they are, we need to pay added attention on them to help them with the transition. Sixth, conduct a simulation or a game-based workshop to identify resistance in a non-threatening way. It helps bring the team together and simulate situations where they get to express how they feel through their activities. How they react in a simulation or game may relate to how they actually feel about the change in reality. And lastly, the seventh, run an analysis of attitude, behavior, and culture okay, to find out which consequences sustain current behavior and prevent the acceptance of new or changed behavior. We always talk about a cultural change that needs to take place, but we forget that culture will only change when the behavior of people is changed. And in order to change people's behavior, we need to change people's attitude. All three are inter interrelated. So these are the seven possible things we could help identify resistance. Okay. Now, once we have identified it, what do we do? Okay. So yes, it does exist. Now there are various tactics we could use to overcome the resistance, and I'll share with you eight possible things we could do to help manage it. First, we need to deliver targeted communications that addresses the what's in it for me question, which is usually the question people will ask. Okay, In reality, not only this, but all other questions that they could be asking. Okay, We could come up with FAQs okay, and make that uh, widely and easily available to everyone. Second, we need to provide education and training to raise awareness of the need to change and equip people with the necessary knowledge, skills, and capability to do so. Third, involve employees in the improvement initiative. Get everyone to participate in the change. Yeah? Involve employees are more likely to buy into the change than oppose it as they are now part of it. Fourth, be open and honest. Okay? That includes being transparent in all we do. Do not hide anything. That helps build trust, not only uh, with you, but also with management and the organization. Fifth, okay, having, having understood objections to change, remove the barriers whenever possible. A barrier may include, for example, an employee believing they do not have the right skill to make the change, which can be addressed through further education and training. Six, if resistance is due to change fatigue, we then have to prioritize our improvement initiative. 
if we need to reduce the priority, so be it. Okay. Seventh, provide sponsors and line managers with the right messaging and tools to help them transition their people to the change. Okay. Um, that could include providing support and channels where people can get more information about the improvement. And last but not least, we need to be aware that nothing drives encouragement better than a success story. Create and communicate quick wins. Invite other groups or teams to tell success stories about their service management improvement initiatives. Okay. So in summary, know why we are improving. Listen to the voice of the customer and let the voice of the customer drive our improvement initiative. Remember the five essentials, having clear and relevant objectives, okay? um, having a strong and committed leadership, having willing participants, having prepared participants, and sustaining our improvement. Resistance, yes, do not resist it. Okay? First, identify resistance and then manage it. At the end of the day, borrowing on the tagline of Nike, just do it. Do not procrastinate. Yes, we do need to improve because things will not change if we do not. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Yeah, um, we already do have a couple, Kevin. I just want to remind everyone that you um, can still ask questions right now. It is an open forum. Um, so we'll go into the first one here, Kevin, which is um, with reference to sustaining the improvement, what are some of, what are some of the things we could do um, to keep the momentum of change going? Okay, um, there are actually several ways we could do that. My recommendation is to try to do something that is simple and workable. And a good example would be to use maybe lean IT initiatives, if you're familiar with that. And that could include things like um, conducting daily huddles and visual review boards to aid the teams to see where they are and how they are, they are doing in this improvement initiatives. So daily huddles, maybe you just spend five, 10 minutes each morning to get Quick, to quickly get feedback from the team members. Okay, I found these very short sessions to be very valuable okay, in getting interaction and feedback from the team members about the, the, the change initiative that is taking place. That's one way. Okay, all right. And uh, the second question that we have here is, um, can you give an example of what barriers we have to remove when people are resisting change? Okay, that's a good question. Um, there are many examples and it really depends on what is changing and why they are resisting. Um, I was recently in an organization where staff were unhappy about the move to a new building. And that was because they were being moved from cubicles to open sitting concept, meaning no more partition, partitions, just tables, okay, which, are, which had to be kept clean at the end of the day. Um, again, this is all about being outside one's comfort zone that one has gotten so used to. Yeah, so they were basically um, complaining about that particular change. Now, I had actually seen a similar initiative take place successfully in a different organization, when the staff found out that everyone, including the CEO and his directs, okay, were also going to be sitting in an open concept. Okay. Um, there was basically nothing left to complain about. Okay, so here, the barrier of inequality was actually removed. Everybody was the same. There was no comparison to be made anymore. So in this way, how they removed those those um, resistance was basically by leading by example. Yeah, if senior management could do it, nobody else could actually complain about it. That's one way we can do that. Okay. All right. Thank you for the, the great answers, Kevin. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that we had come in. I just want to uh, thank everyone again for, for joining today and want to let everybody know that um, if you happen to miss the first two sessions of, the, of this webinar series, they are available on our Vimeo channel. That is Vimeo 
com slash Quentin Group. Um, but if you registered for this session, um, I will be providing all of the links to uh, to view all of those videos online as well. Here are all the methods that you have to contact us. Um, we're active on just about every single social media channel um, where you can check out our latest uh, um announcements for upcoming webinars, uh, white papers, and other thought-provoking material on uh, ITSM, Lean IT, DevOps, uh, IT sourcing, plenty of other subjects as well. And if you'd like to get in contact with Kevin directly, I know he would love to discuss your current situation um, if, if need be. Uh, feel free to contact him. That's, in, that's his information right there. And I know he'd like to get the conversation started if you need help in uh, managing your IT transformation, for example. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining today. Uh, have a wonderful day wherever you are around the world. Bye-bye.